Now let's look at part one of McCloskey's 1983 paper, The Rhetoric of Economics. This part is entitled, Rhetoric is Disciplined Conversation. McCloskey doesn't offer a really strict definition of rhetoric here, except in this pithy line, rhetoric is disciplined conversation. So conversation, what do we mean by conversation? Obviously, a conversation is between uh, interlocutors who are engaged in a discursive exchange of thoughts. So this assumes that each party to the conversation is actually listening to the other and is reacting to the other. So it's, uh, there's, they have to be, at least, you know, there has to be um, two to tango, so to speak, at least two to tango. Uh, if it's um, one person holding forth, that's a lecture, not a conversation. Uh, if it's uh, two people, each talking in turn, but not listening to the other, just waiting for the next one to finish, that is... Um, faux conversation. It's it's not a genuine conversation. Anyway, so rhetoric is about conversation, but it's about disciplined conversation. So what do we mean by disciplined here? Well, being disciplined is using certain rules or norms of discursive exchange. So this assumes a degree of decorum, depending on the context, um, different decorum for different contexts and mutually comprehensible reasoning. So with respect to decorum, we would say that, say, if it's an academic paper, you, it's um, completely unacceptable. It's beyond the boundaries of the norms of, in inverted commas, conversation, to open the paper by, you know, uh, by questioning the honour of the of uh, an opponent's mother, for example, uh, that's beyond the pale, totally unacceptable. Maybe acceptable in a pub context, who knows, but not in academic discourse. And uh, mutually comprehensible reasoning has to be occurring. So there, there have to be rules or norms about, about what would count as a reasonable thing to say or a, a reasonable conclusion to draw. Um, so you can't just run around saying random things. Uh, there has to be discipline to your thought or chains of uh, reasoning. All right. But as to what those rules or norms are is another matter. McCloskey, as I said, only offers this very pithy definition herself, rhetoric is discipline conversation, but she does cite Wayne Booth, in particular uh, Modern Dogma and the Rhetoric of Ascent. Wayne offers a number of different uh, definitions that are, you can see they're all in the same ballpark, but they're sometimes doing slightly different things. So, Booth says, uh, rhetoric is the art of discovering good reasons, finding what really warrants assent. So it's discovering good reasons. Um, carefully weighing of more or less good reasons to arrive at more or less probable or plausible conclusions. Okay, I suppose the key thing here is, you know, the, the, the reasons for a conclusion don't have to be absolutely rock-solid, undoubtable, uh, and nor do the conclusions have to be rock-solid, undoubtable. The, 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 the reasons for a conclusion can be fallible, they can be corrigible, they can be revisable, they might, they're not necessarily perfect, uh, they're debatable. Um, and similarly, the conclusions are also 
fallible, corrigible, revisable, debatable. Um, they don't have to command assent on the part of uh, the listeners. Uh, Booth also offers this rhetoric is the art of discovering warrantable beliefs and improving those beliefs in shared discourse. So here, this, uh, here uh, Booth is saying that rhetoric is dynamic in a sense. That is, it's not just about putting forward, putting forward your best reasons for the conclusions that you want others to hold to, but it's also discovering whether those reasons um, could be improved upon. Uh, and that occurs by engaging in discussion with others. Uh, McCloskey says the, the lineage that we should be thinking about when we talk about rhetoric is Aristotle, Cicero, Quintilian. These are the kind of from the, these are from the classical uh, Greek and Roman period. And later on in the 19th and 20th century, something called, especially the 20th century, something called New Rhetoric, which is really a revival of the classical tradition and an updating of the classical tradition. And we can also throw in the post-positivist philosophers of science and, and pragmatists, such as uh, William James and John Dewey. What's this rhetoric against? Um, by the way, why the emphasis here on the why talk about this definition because rhetoric um, very often in common parlance has a bad name. We say, oh, that's just rhetorical cant, or, or that politician, that was just uh, the rhetoric of a politician. In, in other words, suggesting it was somehow deceptive talk or, um, or was just ornamental talk. It wasn't um, getting to the substance of an issue. It was in some sense superficial or designed to manipulate the reasoning processes of, a, um, of an audience. Uh, here we're talking about rhetoric is, is disciplined conversation, that is there are rules to it and it's, it is genuinely about finding reasons for beliefs and fi improving on the reasons that you might already have for beliefs or casting aside beliefs because those reasons that you had turn out to not be very good. Anyway, so what's this rhetoric as conceived of here by McCloskey and Booth opposed to? What they're opposed to is what we can call a foundationalist epistemological project that runs from, well, McCloskey dates it to René Descartes, in the 1600s, right up to the 20th century with a philosophy of science called logical empiricism. And uh, what's common to everyone, although they have very different views, they do have underlying common presuppositions. And the chief one is their conception of knowledge. And that is, knowledge is ultimately guaranteed true belief. Um, which is secured uh, by deductive logic from self-evident axioms or from observations of facts. So rhetoric is opposed to this project because it doesn't uh, hold that there is guaranteed true beliefs. That's why we saw before it's about um, probable, probably true conclusions or plausibly true conclusions or reasonable conclusions or um, fair conclusions to draw but not guaranteed truths that can't be doubted. Actually the this foundational project goes back before Descartes, it goes right back to um, Plato in the uh, Theotetus. Uh, he's the first one to put forward this definition of knowledge as he calls it's just it's commonly tr uh, translated as justified true belief.
but it's more than just justified true belief because the justification here has to secure truth. So the justification is guaranteed, it really has to guarantee the truth of a belief. And uh, that's what rhetoric, this, the conception of rhetoric being talked about here is, is different to that. It's, uh, it's fallibilist. So McCloskey says that economists have accepted the positivist version of this project from the 20th century as their official methodology despite not actually following it and despite its intellectual bankruptcy. Um, and obviously, uh, if you're not really, if you're espousing it but you don't really follow it, then you're being um, hypocritical and or, and or delusional. And uh, if it's intellectually bankrupt, then you shouldn't really be following it, even if you are aware of it. So, um, so that's what McCloskey has to say in part one of this article.